All right. Well, we're at five minutes past the hour, so I think this is a, a good uh, time to, to get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to um, today's discussion uh, of the Mumbuka complementary currency, uh, a really, really fascinating um, social technology uh, developed uh, and implemented in the city of Marica and the state of Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. Uh, it's really um, our, our great pleasure um, to, to welcome you today um, to what I think is going to be a, a fascinating discussion, and we're privileged um, to have with us today um, the author of a newly published report um, through the Drain Family Institute, uh, Andrea Gama, um, who will be uh, presenting a, a bit of her findings. Uh, and then uh, we're uh, equally privileged to have with us Julian Jonker and Emmanuel Bofi, uh, who uh, will both be offering uh, their thoughts about, about this work and about uh, the um, potential and the nature of complementary currencies more broadly. Uh, so uh, I'll be introducing them all in more detail in just a second. Uh, but uh, before that, um, just a couple words um, to sort of contextualize this initiative. Um, first off, um, uh, today um, you're, you're joining the Jane Family Institute um, for, for today's webinar. Uh, we are an applied research organization in the social sciences uh, based in New York City. Uh, and uh, our, our central objective is to accelerate uh, promising interventions in the applied social sciences uh, and to help uh, bring them from uh, conceptualization to uh, realization and implementation in policy. Uh, and uh, one of our projects uh, for the last four years has been the study uh, together with the Universidade Federal Fluminense, the Federal Fluminense University, which is a, a large public university uh, in the state of Rio uh, in Brazil, uh, to, to work with them to study uh, the really impressive and um, large scale guaranteed income program uh, being implemented in the city of Marica, which is a city of about 200,000 people about an hour outside of Rio. Uh, we were so excited to join together uh, to undertake a mixed method study of this initiative because it isn't just a basic or guaranteed income program in isolation, though in fact it is a, a very significant program that involves the transfer of a significant share of resources, um, uh, really roughly equivalent to the individual poverty line in Brazil, uh, to more than 42,000 people in this city. Uh, but because it's, this program is understood to be part of a broader suite of initiatives uh, under the header of the solidarity economy. Uh, the notion is that the city of Marica is going to take an oil royalty windfall because it's currently benefiting from very large per capita uh, royalty inflows from oil production off the coast uh, and to turn those resources into a vision of economic transformation that works from the bottom up. So the solidarity economy involves the creation of a new infrastructure uh, centered on a complementary digital currency uh, administered by a community bank, the Banco Mumbuka, uh, which uh, is used to pay social benefits like the basic income and other benefits as well, uh, and uh, which is also used to help drive a, a virtuous cycle of microcredit, uh, of uh, zero um, and uh, low interest loans for groups of residents who want to invest uh, in businesses or improve their homes. Um, it's also tied into a broader uh, network of transformative interventions, including savings accounts for public school students that mature upon their graduation, uh, including free public transportation throughout the city, including a variety of um, supports for cooperatives. Uh, basically, the idea is to offer a different model of local development, uh, one that uh, very much seeks to involve uh, ordinary people in, in Mardi Khan to ensure that the benefits are filtering up rather than trickling down. And so this initiative excited us. And as a result, we have uh, been working together uh, again now for, for more than four years um, to study this program through uh, a, a quantitative um, study that involved um, surveys of more than 5,000 Marika residents and the preliminary results of which should be available uh, by the end of this year. Uh, ver uh, we've also employed a variety of qualitative instruments, including interviews with individuals involved in the implementation and design of the program, as well as three um, different scripts that we used with beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries to understand uh, their experience of the program and their understanding of the uh, transformations underway in Mardika. Uh, and of course, in addition, um, we've uh, supported a number of related projects, including Andrea's really amazing study of the Mumbuka currency and uh, the, uh, the broader Mumbuka economy that it powers. 
so uh, with all of that uh, being said, just by way of contextualization, um, I'd love now to uh, introduce our speakers uh, and then uh, to, uh, to hand the baton to Andrea for her presentation. Uh, so uh, first, uh, we have with us today the author of the report, We Take Mumbukas, Andrea Gama. Um, she's an economics master's student at the Universidade Federal Fluminense in Niterói, Brazil, uh, and she has been a critical part of the Marica Basic Income Evaluation Research Team. Um, she's interested in applied microeconomics, public policy, and the evaluation of welfare programs. Um, so after Andrea presents, uh, we're uh, going to be very fortunate to hear from Julian Jonker and Emmanuel Bofi. Uh, Julian is an assistant professor in legal studies and business ethics at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. His current research interests are in the impact of digital technology on work and the social ontology and politics of money. His most recent publication is an edited volume about equality in the workplace entitled Working as Equals, which has just been published with Oxford University Press. Uh, we're also um, fortunate to hear from Emmanuel Bofi. Emmanuel is currently a professor in the Department of Economics at the uh, Federal Fluminense University. He graduated in economics from the Federal University of Rio and holds a master's degree in communication and culture from the same university. His master's thesis looked at issues of community communication between the Novartis Foundation for Sustainable Development and an NGO called Service for Popular Education and Organization. He completed his doctorate in 2009 at the Federal Fluminense University with a thesis in the field of the history of economics. He has community experiences um, since 2002 in the communities of Sururi and Parara Angelica. Uh, he worked between 2019 and 22 uh, on the Olia Ella, uh, Olia Ella, uh, sorry, project, uh, serving as a, as an instructor of the po of popular financial education in the communities noted above. Uh, his current interests involve the study of economic thought, the investigation of how economic ideas travel in different socio-cultural contexts, and the interaction between economic theories and political and social factors that influence their practical application. Like, this is uh, really a spectacular group of people to have together talking about uh, what, to my mind, is one of the most exciting local development initiatives underway anywhere. And of course, we really want to involve uh, all of the attendees in the conversation too. So after we've heard from our panelists, uh, we'll be uh, opening the floor to questions. And at any point, um, please do uh, type your questions directly into the Q&A box, uh, which uh, will go kind of directly to the panelists. Um, so um, with all of that being said, uh, it's my uh, great pleasure um, to uh, turn uh, the floor over to Andrea Gama, uh, who will uh, present uh, some of her findings uh, on the Mambuka. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you're hearing me fine. Thank you for being here. I will share my screen while I I talk a little bit. Um, as Paul kindly introduced me, I am Andrea Gama I, from the Universidad Federal Fluminense, and I thank the JFI and Paul for putting together this event today and for the opportunity for collaborating on this topic that is very dear to me. Um, and a huge thank you to Francis who made this whole investigation a lot more interesting by working on the visualization tool that we are debuting here today. I hope that you all will feel feel you know compelled to and will enjoy exploring the tool and the website of the report a little bit and coming up with your own conjectures about what goes on in Marika and uh, and the Mumbuka exchanges. Um, coincidentally, this, this event is happening at the end of a week where the Mumbuka Bank and the Mumbuka celebrated 10 years of their creation. It's a, it's a fortunate uh, co coincidence, so I would also like to take the time to, you know, say thanks to the Mumbuka Bank and to, to the Adenator personnel who, um, for their time and information sharing with us that made this whole work possible, and also to share the curiosity that the Mumbuka Bank put together a documentary that will they soon will be that they, it's soon going to be online. Um, so I'm excited to hear from that. So today I will talk about the Mumbuka, the, the local digital currency from Marika. I'll go over a little bit Marika and it, it's the lo local crash transfer programs that are created in Mumbukas about how the Mumbuka works. And then I'll go into the description and analysis of the Mumbuka circulation from 2018 to August, 2020, a period for which we have transaction data. And then we were able to put together this narrative that I hope you find very compelling. The overall idea is to, pre to present here is to present the mo this model's potential on local development, uh, local development and on policy design. So as Paul said before, 
Marikaiza City in the metropolitan area of Rio. The very recent census, 2022 census, tells us that it's home to over 197,000 inhabitants. However, Marika is considered a bedroom community in which many of its residents actually work in cities nearby like Rio, Niteroi, and São Gonçalo. The Mumbuka model of local currency and the cash transfer policies actually influence nearby cities to develop their own policies based on this one, like Niteroi with the Araribóia local currency. And that on itself is a testament to how the Mumbuka model achieved recognition in the region. So what is the Mumbuka? The Mumbuka is one of Brazil's first digital local currency with municipal reach, and that was also created in association to a cash transfer program or a guaranteed income policy. It was created uh, with the 2013 municipal law that created the Solidarity Economy Program. It was conceived to be used as a tool in the, in the program to pay for cash transfer benefits. Um, the program itself goes beyond just cash transfer and the local currency, and it, its goal is to reduce poverty and inequality while promoting local development, so the currency itself shares the same values. The Mumbuka circulates only in Marica within individuals and businesses that, are, that have an, a Mumbuka bank account, and its value is equivalent to Brazil's local currency, the real. So why did Marica create a local currency? The idea behind paying cash transfer benefits in local currency is to avoid resources spillover since so many of Marika residents actually work elsewhere. And with that, incentivize consumption and with that, you know, broaden the production and promote local development. Um, a component of this is the integration of the local economy. So, so local currencies as a whole uh, intends to connect individuals and businesses by creating a segment of economic activity, so transactions and exchanges that happen in the local currency. And by happening in Mumbukas, this economic activity is assured to be happening within Marika. And beyond its initial goals, the Mumbuka model and the Mumbuka system became an important tool for this municipal government to reach its most vulnerable citizens because over 20% of the residents of Marika are covered by this cash transfer policies and therefore use Mumbukas, the city government has this segment of the population map, mapped out and accessible through this banking-like system. And this is particularly relevant in a country like Brazil, where not all of its population, especially the more vulnerable population, is not necessarily integrated to the traditional financial and banking apparatus. And the importance of this tool, of the Mumbuka as a tool, became especially evident um, in, during times of crisis. So during the pandemic, when the local government uh, put in place programs to help the residents of Marika, and last year, Marika suffered with heavy rains that caused some destruction. And within days, the city government was able to concede financial help to citizens, to, to residents, um, who suffered from that. So all that through the Mumbuka Bank and through Mumbukas. I'll then now present a timeline, a little bit of timeline from the Mumbukas and for the cash transfer programs. So the Mumbuka began in 2013, but it was only in 2018 that it joined the Ed Dinheiro platform. So it was only from 2018 that all residents of Marika could access the Mumbuka, could have a Mumbuka bank account. Uh, before that, only beneficiaries received their Mumbukas in like a debit card that worked like a voucher. And as soon as they used it at businesses, it became highs. Um, now, through the Adiero platform, the Mumbuka bank accounts work like an online banking platform, so anyone can open an account and use the Mumbukas, and it's only from this point on that we can really talk about a Mumbuka circulation, and it's from this point on that it becomes traceable, the circulation becomes traceable, especially for its digital nature. Between 2018 and 2020, the main program, the main cash transfer program that paid, was paid in Mumbukas was the citizens' basic income that going forward, I'll be referring to as the RBC, Renda Basca Cidadania in Portuguese. Um, the RBC is a, is a benefit that targets families with up to three minimum wages and income. So it's more like a guaranteed income policy. And between 2018 and 2020, saw a huge increase in beneficiaries because it went from a household benefit to an individual benefit and more individuals registered in it. So over, right now, it, it reaches over 42%, 42,000, sorry, of the Marikas population. And in April 2020, in response to the pandemic effects, the city government more than doubled the RBC benefit, and they created the worker support program that paid one minimum wage in Mumbukas to over 20,000 
workers that had their economic activities affected by the pandemic. So the city government responded to the pandemic and to its economic effects within one month of the official lockdown in Brazil and effected those payments through the Mumbuka Bank and in Mumbucas. So how does the currency work? The Mumbuka is issued in the payment of the cash transfer benefits. Individuals and businesses have to register at the Mumbuka Bank to open a Mumbuka Bank account. Transactions can be carried out through mobile app or through debit card in case of beneficiaries. And businesses pay a 2% fee per sale in Mumbukas and a 1% fee for Mumbuka conversion, except in the first week of the month. The fee collection goes to the Mumbuka Bank Fund that finances social activities and microcredit lines at low interest rates. By August 2020, over 57,000 accounts were registered in the Mumbuka Bank, belonging to over 43,000 people. I segmented the accounts in the Mumbuka Bank into three types. Those are the RBC beneficiary accounts for the RBC beneficiaries. Those can only make payments. Business accounts for commercial activity and individual non-RBC accounts. Those are for regular users that are not beneficiaries and for beneficiaries of worker support program that began in April 2020. So for example, in this previous slide here on the on the left is a print screen of my Idinero account and I would be an individual non-RBC account because I'm not a beneficiary. This is a diagram that I put together. Oh, sorry. And these two businesses and individuals can, other than make payments in Mumbukas, they can also receive payments in Mumbukas and they can convert their Mumbukas to highs. And what that means is that when they convert the Mumbukas to highs, the Mumbuka exits circulation. Here. So this the diagram tries to illustrate, it's a little confusing, I'm sorry, tries to illustrate the Mumbuka ecosystem. So Mumbuka enters circulation through the payment of benefits. The Mumbuka circulation refers to this in yellowish, that is the transactions between beneficiaries, non-beneficiaries, and businesses. And the circulation and the conversion of Mumbuka to highs fee collection goes to the Mumbuka bank that in turn can finance, can fund microcredit lines that benefit a range of Mumbuka users. As I mentioned before, between 2018 and 2020, there was an increase in beneficiaries. And we can see here in the yellow, but this increase in the beneficiaries implied in an increase in businesses registering the Mumbuka Bank to accept Mumbukas because there was an increase in demand for sales in Mumbukas. And also as hinted before, the more beneficiaries there are, the more the value of the benefit increases, the more mumbukas are being issued and more mumbukas are circulating. But the more mumbukas are being issued does not mean that only beneficiaries are using more mumbukas. Businesses also increase their mumbukas usage in the period. And this growth of the mumbuka economy can be also presented or illustrated in the sense of the increase of the complexity of the Mumbuka network. I'll then change to the report website to demonstrate here in the, in the visualization tool. So here in yellow, we see the transaction volume by RBC beneficiaries, in red by individual non-RBC accounts, and in blue are different categories of businesses. So if we look at 2018, 2019, and 2020, what we see is, is there is an increase in lines and arrows connecting different agents of the Mumbuka economy. That is what I mean by increased complexity or increased intricacy of the Mumbuka economy. Um, that is because there is an increase in volume being transacted, but also because there is a diversification in businesses that, that registered in the Mumbuka Bank. We can also look at uh, a pointed example of this. If we look at individual non-RBC accounts, um, if we zoom in, we can see that in 2018, most of their Mumbukas came from transfers from RBC beneficiaries and they, and they could spend at a few business categories. And when we switch to 2020, we see that they spend at a lot more types of businesses. Um, so that is also an indication of the diversification in businesses registering and maybe a diversification in consumption. Looking at the individual use of the Mumbukas, so RBC beneficiaries and individual non-RBC accounts, we know that the, the businesses that they spend the most Mumbukas in is food, retail pharmacies, and retail businesses. We can see that because it's the thicker arrows coming out of the RBC beneficiary uh, circle. So here, retail pharmacies food and retail business. And that happens throughout all the years of Mumbuka usage. And that makes sense 
because when the Mambuka first started, so in 2013, most of the businesses that registered to accept Mambukas were of food and pharmacies. And in 2020, that also happens, but it's a little bit harder to see because the, the arrows now are more diffused, again, indicating a diversification in consumption. And we do have an inclination that that happens because here we can see that in 2018, 96% of all expenditure by RBC beneficiaries were spent on these five categories. And in 2020, that fell to 84% of all expenditure. But beyond looking at the behavior of individuals and how individuals use their mambukas, what I find particularly interesting is taking a look at how businesses use their mambukas. Because businesses can keep mambukas circulating for longer since they can receive and use their mambukas. So they are able to keep the mambukas circulating for an indeterminate period of time. So what are the businesses that um, are in the mambuka bank? They range from large supermarket chains to small local vendors and different types of businesses and different sizes of businesses have different incentives, whether to use mumbukas or convert them to highs. Say that, for example, for to pay wages or to restock from outside the city or to send profits to headquarters elsewhere. Those are especially true for larger enterprises and chain enterprises. What we see in this period, 2018 to August 2020, is that businesses removed most of the mambukas from circulation. But we also see that they that that decrease the the percentage of how much of the mambukas they removed from circulation decreased, and they use more of the mambuka. So in 2018, businesses used three percent of their revenues in mambuka, and in 2020, that went up to eight percent. And in fact, we do see here that businesses between 2019 and 2020 more than doubled the, their, their share of participation in the Mumbuka economy overall. So went going from 2% to 5%. That means that not only businesses are spending more Mumbukas, they're spending a larger volume of Mumbukas, but they're making up a larger share of the Mumbuka economy as a whole. So the larger the Mumbuka economy became, more all agents participated in it. And that to me indicates a consolidation of the Mumbuka economy. If we take a look at a specific type of business, the scenario is slightly different. 54% of businesses registered in the Mumbuka Bank belong to beneficiaries of the municipal cash transfer programs. And because of that, we assume that they are small to medium local businesses. And because of that, they have different incentives to use their mumbukas, for example, to restock within the city, perhaps creating a chain of production. For example, if you have a bakery, you can buy your flour from um, a market and your egg from an egg vendor and all in mumbukas because they are there locally. And what we see is that those businesses, the, the beneficiaries as businesses actually do use more of their Mumbuka. So in 2018, they used 11% of their revenues in Mumbuka. And in 2020, they used 31% of their revenues in Mumbukas. And that might be to the significant increase in their revenues because there are more Mumbuka circulating between 2018 and 2020. That might be because they became more familiarized with the Mumbuka system. They were more comfortable using the Mumbuka or because more businesses and more different types of businesses register at the bank where they can shop at and restock or exchange with, for example. And because of that, because they use more than Mumbukas, they keep the Mumbuka circulating longer. So we can conclude that these small and medium local businesses have the potential to bolster the Mumbuka circulation even more by using it more than one time. To exemplify this growth, pro growth diversification process and how local businesses can have this potential, I show this example here that's also in the report. We can imagine, for example, in 2018, uh, retail pharmacies receive mumbukas from RBC beneficiaries and they convert most of their mumbukas to high sticker arrow coming here and they can spend a, a few businesses few local businesses that accept Mumbukas. In 2020, however, there are a lot more types of businesses that accept Mumbukas, so they can actually spend the Mumbukas they receive to restock, for example, an office supply store with paper or to buy construction material to do the upkeep of the building and so forth. What that means, what I mean by that is that a larger, more integrated Mumbuka economy encourages its own growth because then businesses can keep restocking from within and they can keep exchanging within the Mumbuka economy. 
And in fact, we do see that 46% of Maul Mubukas that were issued in 2018 to August 2020 period remained in circulation. Well, so they, they kept circulating, they were being used more than once, and they actually yielded transaction value equivalent to 1.8 times their stock. So the same Mubuka was used more than once. So here it's being used like 1.8 times. And that is what we call that generated a multiplier effect in the economy. It deepens the local currency circulation. This is also illustrated here. So the Mumbuka circulation here, 46% kept being circulating here that generated transactions equivalent to 1.8 times the, the value of it, that stock. And that happens because of the circular nature of the Mumbuka economy. Businesses and individuals can keep exchanging Mumbukas amongst themselves indeterminately. And that is what generates the multiplier effect and what we hope to help the growth of the local economy. And now I'm steering towards my final considerations. Uh, what I presented here is the growth and the increased complexity of the Mumbukas and how more people and more different types of agents in the Mumbuka economy are connected. And that all is heavily associated to the cash transfer policy the city has. And it also shows how the city, the, the Mumbuka actually became a tool for the city, be that to reach its citizens or to fulfill specific program goals. But what, what I would like to argue is that the Mumbuka model is a system that feeds back to itself. And with that, it could really bolster the intended effect of programs by affecting the lives of other people, not only beneficiaries or the residents of Marika. Because the sales in Mumbukas uh, charge a fee that go back to the Mumbuka bank fund, the more the Mumbuka circulates, the more the bank has fund to finance microcredit lines at low interest rates to sponsor local athletes and students and so forth. So not only do beneficiaries benefit from the cash transfer programs because they have an increase in their purchasing power, they can also spend freely their Mumbukas and Marika, they have no limitation. And because so many businesses or so different types of businesses accept Mumbukas, they actually have no restriction to the type of use of the cash transfer program they have. Businesses naturally also benefit because that resource is being spent locally and other residents of Marika benefit from the solidarity economy initiatives of the Mumbuka Bank that hinge on the Mumbuka circulation. So Marika's experience serves to demonstrate how different elements of local policies can be combined. And by having the local currency as a focal point, it highlights local development as a priority. And I think that is the main argument that I was trying to make here. Uh, with that, I, I conclude this presentation. I hope you found this interesting and I hope it raises some very interesting discussion points and I'm eager to hear the comments from, from the other panelists and I thank them for being here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrea, for that um, excellent um, presentation of this really fascinating report um, and, and also for showing us a, a bit of the visualization in action. I, I'm remiss for not having mentioned in introducing our panelists that actually the uh, kind of a core um, component of this analysis is uh, that uh, really um, exciting interactive visualization tool um, that um, Andrea um, showed us um, uh, in, in motion, uh, which was designed by, by JFI's own Francis Sang, um, who unfortunately um, isn't able to join us today, but um, uh, you know deserves um, quite a bit of credit for, I think, um, helping to bring uh, many of um, Andrea's um, insights into uh, into action, uh, which is uh, you know kind of why I, I encourage everyone um, uh, who's um, watching along at home to um, to click through um, the link that was shared in the chat and uh, and to give the uh, the interactive visualization a uh, a try for themselves. Um, so um, thank you so much, um, uh, Andrea, for the presentation. Um, and now um, it is our, our great pleasure um, to turn to Julian Jonker for uh, a uh, kind of whatever whatever thoughts and, and ideas um, this uh, presentation and, and research have sparked. Great. Thanks so much, Paul, and thanks so much, Andrea, for that fascinating report. Um, so by training, I'm a philosopher, but I think about money, which most of you will think is some sort of contradiction in terms. Uh, what I want to do, however, is just situate um, this extraordinary project and uh, my opinionated take on the philosophy of money, just give you some background in order to articulate, I think, some of the questions that I have about the project um, and, and, and hopefully 
um, this this might sort of guide some of the research going forward. Um, so to start off, the traditional philosophical question about money is that uh, what is money? Um, Ira Glass asked this question once on This American Life, and he immediately qualified it by calling it the most stoner question he had ever asked on the show. In other words, the philosophical question is likely to induce your eyes to roll. Um, you might think we all get along perfectly well in the world with just our practical ability to recognize which things are money, say these dollar bills in my pocket, and how to use them. Why should we think that there is any deeper knowledge to be had by philosophizing about money? Well, you might think, uh, like the NPR reporter Jacob Goldstein does in his book, simply titled Money, that the real philosophical question here is whether money is real. After all, when markets collapsed during 2020 and the Federal Reserve increased the supply of money, at least by some measures, uh, by trillions of dollars, by basically pressing a key on a keyboard, um, you might think after that, uh, money could not be as real as, say, this chair that I'm sitting on. Um, but uh, 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 there is a philosophical question here. I don't think that it's usefully put as a metaphysical question about the reality of money. Uh, money clearly matters to all of us, whatever its metaphysical status, um, and its mattering is all that all the reality that we need of it. Um, so I think the real philosophical question here is how does money come to matter, and how does it matter to us? And these are really political questions. They are questions about how money is authorized and what money in turn authorizes. So instead of asking which thing, say gold coins or doge coins, whether these things are money, what we should ask is how do gold coins or doge coins get to be money? Now, there are two traditional answers to that question of how something comes to be money. One answer goes by the name of the commodity theory and it might seem like common sense to anyone who has thought about how cigarettes come to be money in a prism. Indeed, it seemed like common sense to Adam Smith, who wrote the following just so story in The Wealth of Nations. Uh, imagine individuals have different needs and would like to exchange things with each other in order to satisfy those needs. Say one individual wants to exchange a sheep for another individual's bushel of wheat. Uh, but one person doesn't always have what the other person wants in the moment. So it would be useful to have some universal means of exchange, say cans of fish or nuggets of gold that have been nicely rounded into coins that can be counted easily, right? And we can use those things to exchange. So people come to coordinate in a decentralized way without any state intervention upon this universal means of exchange. And just the way that, say, English speakers come to coordinate upon a particular set of words as the words which have meaning for them. Similarly, prisoners converge upon cigarettes as the thing that they are always willing to trade in a prison. And, and convergence here means that they come to stably expect that everyone else will expect that everyone will accept cigarettes as payments. In the terms of game theory, money is a shelling point in a coordination game. So that's one story. The second answer goes under various names, but let's just call it the state theory of money. It says that something becomes money when the state anoints it as money. Indeed, that the state must be involved for something to be money. Warren Mosler, the economist whom Stephanie Kelton credits as being the originator of modern monetary theory, tells the following just so story. Once upon a time, the state needed people to do various jobs for it. They needed people to fight in its army, grow corn, etc. Now, one way to get people to do things for you as the state is to stand over them with weapons and tell them what to do. Uh, but the state discovered a more efficient way of doing things. It would come to us at the end of the year and say, we need you to hand over a certain number of tokens. And if you don't, we'll punish you with weapons or put you in jail or whatever. Now, it turns out that the way to get these tokens is to do the things that the state wants you to do, fight in a time you grow corn, etc. So you better do those things. Otherwise, the state will come around at the end of the year and punish you. And it turns out that having these tokens is valuable for that reason. So if I want to get someone else to do something for me, maybe work in my store while I go and fight in the army, the best way to get them to do that is to offer them the tokens because they need the tokens. In this way, the tokens come to be money. 
they come to something that everyone is willing to accept as payment. Um, it's money because it's a universal unit of account that has been stamped with the authority of the state through its demands for tax, rather than because it has been the convergent point of a decentralized consensus as in Adam Smith's just so story. So two stories. Um, in fact, the anthropological evidence seems to point in favor of the second story, but it's a larger philosophical debate, which of these stories tells, as it were, the necessary story of how many comes to be. But still, abstracting from that debate, we see that both theories, both the commodity theory and the state theory, acknowledge that money has a social basis. In the case of the commodity theory, the social basis is those interlocking, mutually referring expectations that bring people to converge on, say, cigarettes as their money. In the case of the state theory, it is the state, the stable commitments that we have toward the authority of the state, our fear or our respect or whatever, that authority then being conferred upon the gold coins or bank deposits or whatever the state has anointed as money. Now, the crypto folks have a nice metaphor for this social basis of money. In their world, blockchains like the Bitcoin or Ethereum protocols are what they call layer ones. And there are further blockchains and protocols that can be built on top of this, perhaps with specific uses or perhaps with technological advantages. And those are called layer twos or even layer threes. And then some of these crypto folks self-reflectively point out that people are layer zero. And what they mean is that all of these technologically sophisticated protocols, at the end of the day, must be built upon social expectations. There must be some social scene in order to get them to work. A distributed ledger like the Bitcoin blockchain is only meaningful if there are some people who treat it as meaningful. This is an important qualification to their belief that code obviates the need for interpersonal trust. As sociologist Nigel Dodd points out, money is a verb rather than a noun. It is something we do rather than something that is. It requires some sort of social practice. Now, and I'm sort of finally getting to my main point here, the social basis for money is accompanied by a political imaginary. Now, to go back to the crypto folks, this is vivid in their case. After all, the origins of Bitcoin lie in the cypherpunk movement, a group of anarcho-libertarians who believed that private key cryptography would bring about a future free of governments. This was their imagined utopia. Bitcoin may be in the process of being tamed by Wall Street, uh, but its cyber libertarian imaginary is what keeps it going through bear markets and regulatory crackdowns. It's not only cryptocurrencies that have a political imaginary. Consider a classic complementary currency, the Brixton Pound, started in 2009. Its founders were part of a collective called Brixtopia. They called themselves a collective with a nation state of mind rather than a nation state. The Brixton Pound aims to keep money circulating within the South London neighborhood rather than being extracted by national businesses and chain stores. Um, uh, these things are all reminiscent of what we've just been hearing about. Uh, but note that the Brixton Pound is denominated in printed notes that feature Brixton luminaries such as David Bowie and CLR James. Thereby, they circulate not just value within the community, but political, local identity. And for a third example, Nigel Dodd reminds us that the euro is not just the type of money, but one of the foundational institutions of a united Europe, a project whose emotional resonance is rooted in the catastrophic wars of the 20th century. So when the US dollar reached parity with the euro last year, newspaper commentators took this not just as an economic fact, but rather as a judgment about the state of the European project. So my main question about the Mambuka is, what is its political imaginary? How do people see themselves through it? Does the Mumbuka encourage them to reimagine their community of Marika as a socially or even politically autonomous zone? Or does it, on the other hand, as an extension of the real to which it is pegged, encourage them to see themselves as having a stake in the Brazilian nation state or something else? Now, let me gesture two strategies for extending this line of questioning about the political meaning of money. 
The first would be to describe in greater detail the materiality of the Mumbuka economy. What are the objects and the places that people associate with it? For almost all of human history, money has been conspicuously material. Some examples, on the Micronesian island of Yap, money takes the form of large round stones that cannot be moved. Uh, when people transact, ownership of the stone changes, but not its place. Um, indigenous Americans, such as the Hoopa in the Northwest, use strings of beads as money. They evaluate these strings by stretching them from forefinger to forearm, measuring them against tattoos on their forearms. Uh, but modern money is no less material. If I pay with money on my bank account, I typically do it by tapping or swiping a card that has my bank's logo on it. Maybe you have a personalized card or one that's heavy or black to indicate something about your social status. Perhaps you have an awkward encounter with the cashier because the card doesn't swipe at first. These material artifacts shape the way in which we deal with money, the way in which we think about money, and the interactions and transactions that we have through money. Um, the point of these examples is not to list a set of monetary exotica, but simply to point out that money has a material life that shapes and buttresses its place in the social lives of the people who use it. So I would like to know more about the material life of the Mabuka. The report gives a glimpse of this when it describes the experience of entering Marika as being uh, one of being surrounded by signs proclaiming, we take Mabukas. This is already a vivid image of um, a local identity. Uh, but what else do people see and feel when they take part in the Mabuka economy? The answer to this will begin to add color to our understanding of the Mabuka political imaginary. The second strategy for extending this line of thought is to map the emotional resonances of the ways in which people earn and spend Mumbukas. Now, again, just to give us some backdrop here, for much of the 20th century and before, theorists of money have urged us to see money as neutral, a kind of medium that is colorless, emotionless. Uh, the economists tell a version of this sort of story of neutrality. Um, in microeconomics, there's essentially no place for money. It is entirely transparent. In the monetarist macroeconomics of Milton Friedman and the rational expectation schools that followed, money matters only when it is going wrong, when it is not fully serving its purpose, when it is properly paying its role, it disappears into the background as a substrate for market exchange. The critics of the, the sort of non-economist critics of money, from George Simmel to Marx to Habermas, also see money as colorless. In fact, they see money as a kind of universal solvent that commoditizes and corrupts our social relations by draining them of meaning. Now, economic sociologists like Viviana Zeliza and Nigel Dodd, I think have shown that this is mistaken. Money is not neutral and abstract. It is material, it is laden with affect and meaning. A study of Oslo sex workers in the 1980s reports that they spend their welfare benefits and legal incomes on rent and other facets of their straight life. While they spend their income from sex work on drugs and alcohol and going out, they see the latter income as hot money. It has a certain meaning to them and it reinforces their sense of the illegality and the social marginality of uh, the way they derive their primary income. Zeliza remarks that a Philadelphia gangster refuses to use his criminal income for tithing to church because it's bad money. But he insists on tithing with his good income. Now, in both cases, these two sets of money are what the economists call fungible. It's irrational to demarcate them in this way. So maybe this just underscores the observation of Nobel economist Richard Thaler that keeping separate accounts goes against the dictates of economic rationality, and yet people do it anyway because they are ultimately not rational. But I think the point of these examples goes further. Money does not only serve an economic function in people's lives, it also serves a symbolic and social function. People earmark different kinds of money for different purposes, invoking it as a kind of ritual talisman that helps them observe important differences between different activities. So rather than draining social meaning, money 
is used by people to make meaning in their lives. Now, Andrea's report begins to plot the different ways in which Mambuka circulates in helpful quantitative terms, the different kinds of things that they are used for. What I'm suggesting is to add to this qualitative detail about how people think about their different uses of the Mambuka. How does meaning circulate alongside the economic value of the Mambuka? Um, uh, stepping back, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish on these final thoughts. Um, uh, so what, what have I said so far that is relevant to this sort of project? Surely the Mumbuka is an economic project designed to raise the standard of living of the people of Marika, not to substantiate philosophical musings about the meaning of money. Well, my point is that money is always a political project, whether the state theory or the commodity theory turns out to be right. Money is an arrangement of social expectations, that helps to ease economic transactions, but it also grounds political and social meanings. Now, the Mumbuka may remind you of plans for central bank digital currencies or CBDCs, like the digital yuan and the digital euro. These CBDCs allow for interventions such as basic income and emergency relief at a national level, while critics also worry that they allow for state surveillance and state-imposed restrictions on expenditure. Right? These are sort of political aspects of money writ large. The Mumbuka differs from CBDCs in its local scope and its specificity in the way it attempts to connect a local community into a solidarity economy. So the large issue in the background here is how does the community of Marika relate through its use of the Mumbuka to other political entities? the nation of Brazil, the city of Rio de Janeiro, the demographic groups which define themselves in relation or contrast to Marica, right? Are these relations antagonistic ones, supportive ones, and so on? Um, if the Mabuka is successful in the long run, these relations will surely come to shift. I'll end there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Julian, for those um, really, really uh, excellent and provocative questions and uh, also, uh, Fantastic suggestions for um, you know uh, new layers. I think to um, to add on to this analysis and actually um, fantastically, as I, I'm sure um, Andrea will be um, uh, excited to to share shortly, and I may uh, chime in a, a little bit as well. Um, actually, many of these questions um, are are questions that I think we already have at least some um, resources to begin to answer on the basis of um, you know firsthand experience in Marika, but also um, some of the questions in our um, uh, various qualitative instruments. Um, uh, in dialogue with business owners and beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries that I think can can help to to begin um, uh, to to answer some of these um, really really excellent questions and to um, to add this layer um, of uh, of analysis onto um, uh, the um, kind of existing kind of quantitative approach. So, um, thank you so much for um, for for those um, really fantastic comments, and I'm excited to return to them in in just a second. Um, but first, um, uh, we're also you know so so lucky to have with us today. Uh, Emmanuel Bofi um, and um, Emmanuel, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, on the report um, before we uh, turn back to kind of the uh, the broader discussion. Uh, please take it away. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul, uh, for the invitation. First, um, I think it's very interesting uh, and very um, um, stimulating to have this conversation with all of you. And um, second, I'd like to um, congratulate Andrea on the report, it's really easy to read and, and, and um, the figures are very um, stimulating. I, I guess even if we pass on to students, it's good for, for them to quickly understand uh, what the project is about and how it impacts um, Marika. <clears throat> well, I have um, sort of five uh, remarks about uh, 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 your report. Four of them are more like um, specific to what you wrote, and one of them is more uh, sort of philosophical, like uh, in the lines of what Julian um, uh, talked about. So um, I'm going to start uh, first with the four uh, remarks that are um, related uh, directly to your uh, report. And uh, the first one is um, about information regarding years uh, 2021 and 2022. Uh, I thought first that you uh, would present something or, or information regarding uh, those years, mainly after the pandemic, um, to see if um, those, uh, the complexity of the network, which has been uh, thickening and uh, growing um, more um, complex, continues. Uh, I don't know if you have the information, if you have um, worked on that, but 
Uh, if you have, I think it, it will be useful and uh, interesting for us to, to see what happened after the pandemic and to see if that um, process continued. So that would be the first um, um, remark or question. The second one um, is related. Um, I had a project with Fabio, uh, like during the pandemic with a student, Rodrigo Carvalho, uh, who were, uh, uh, probably Andrea knows him. Um, and we, um, he tried to, to see uh, to what extent uh, Mumbuka could build what uh, Julian uh, um, referred to as the sense of community. Uh, could it like build a sense of community? And uh, one of the things that we um, um, investigated in this uh, 2021 uh, uh, project was um, related to the geographical inequality that's presented in many Brazil, of course, in Brazil as a whole, but in all Brazilian cities, we have many problems with inequality between neighborhoods and stuff. And um, so uh, your report does not make any ref reference to that kind of inequality that exists in uh, Marica. It seems that it's a homogeneous city and M Mumbuka circulates uh, in an equal manner in all neighborhoods. And probably that's not uh, precise. Um, uh, I remember, if I'm not mistaken, like the headquarters of uh, the Mumbuka Bank is in downtown Marica and they have other four branches in neighborhoods. And um, the circulation does not seem to be the same in all uh, neighborhoods. Um, so if you maybe if you could like um, talk about about it, uh, it would be nice to see how geographical inequality impacts uh, what uh, Mumbuka can do for the population. So that's that's uh, that would be the second uh, uh, question. Uh, how does a geographical inequality impact on the effects of uh, Mumbuka? Um, the third remark has to do with uh, one thing that you wrote and that uh, I was sort of uh, thinking about maybe political problems or ethical problems that can relate when, when you're talking about non-beneficiary, um, sorry, uh, non-RBC beneficiaries. And then you mentioned that some um, municipal employees could receive bonuses in Mumbukas. And I was just thinking if that might not, or I don't know, if the political power, as Chilean put it, could not use that um, to keep in power. I don't know, I'm just, I just found it, uh, I don't know, dangerous. If they can pay that, that, that with Mumbuka, I don't know. Uh, I was just uh, asking you if, if, there, if, if there was any discussion or if the the city can use that in a way that might not be ethical, I'm not sure. But I just drew my attention to this point. Uh, if there are any, um, oh, and then uh, another another one. You you can pay employees in Mumbukas as well. I'm not sure if that uh, is possible for businesses that that take Mumbukas. And uh, so that would be uh, the third um, question. Um, the fourth has to do with the relative socioeconomic and uh, political relative, of course, detachment uh, of the program. Um, what happens if uh, the next mayor does not um, favor this uh, policy? Um, does that uh, uh, endanger the project uh, or not? Um, I mean, it would be nice to see if the project can be at least relatively detached from uh, the ups and downs of political uh, progressives that are in, in power. Um, so uh, is there any um, possibility to, to detach uh, the, the project from the, the political whims that sometimes, well, at least we had in Brazil uh, some years ago, not very progressive government at the federal level. And I'm afraid that might happen at Marica at the municipal level as well. So that might endanger the, the, the continuation of the project. And, um, and also I, I was thinking about this social detachment. What happens if one area develops uh, Mumbuka a lot 
and another area of the city does not, uh, neighborhood, for example, does not develop. Could there be some sort of inflation in Mumbukas, for example, in one area where uh, money circulates, Mumbukas circulates a lot in relation to other areas? Um, I'm not sure, just thinking about it, because when you think uh, about economics in Brazil, it's very difficult not to think about inequalities of all sorts of levels. And I was just uh, trying to uh, think in terms of inequality also in, inside, uh, within uh, the city of Marica. Yeah. So uh, these are uh, four questions that are really related uh, more directly to, to, to your report. Yeah. And uh, I have a fifth question that's more sort of a philosophical uh, and sort of complements what Julian um, talked about. And which also has to do with what I, um, with my project, uh, as, I, as uh, Paul told at the beginning of the presentation, I had a project in Bachada, which is near Marica. And um, one of the big problems we have there is um, um, how we uh, understand development. Uh, you, you begin your report, you talk about um, the words you say is like, um, uh, the, the, the motivation of Mumbuk is to stimulate local growth. That's what you put at the beginning in the introduction of your work, of your report. And uh, in the fifth section, you, you, you talked about local economic development. And um, we, uh, our, uh, at our project, uh, we think uh, of a development in terms of this uh, Rio Echo 92 um, uh, definition, which spans the environmental development, social development, and economic development. Uh, we try to combine the three. And uh, this, has, uh, this has been an extraordinarily difficult <laughs> thing to combine, the three kinds of development. Now, the impression I have, and that's maybe we could uh, talk about or um, discuss, is that uh, it seems there is a trilemma uh, it's very hard to, to pick more than two of these uh, three um, types of development. We either have like social and economic development, but then the environment gets lost somehow. Or we have, like for example, in my project, uh, we pay a lot of attention to environmental and social uh, aspects of development. But then the economic lag is weak. Um, your report presents very uh, uh, strong evidence of uh, the economic impact, very positive economic impact of the Mumbuka project. But then I complement what Julian sa uh, said, to what extent does that uh, imply a, a broader uh, definition of de development that encompasses environmental and uh, social aspects? Is it, isn't it dangerous as uh, market relations uh, thicken? that people uh, do not pay attention to social. I, I, I liked uh, uh, Julian's example a lot from the Brixton, I guess, where they put like David Bowie on uh, images on uh, notes and stuff, because that's exactly what gets lost when the economy, economic aspect grows a lot. You lose that uh, com uh, community uh, spirit. And, um, so I don't have an answer for that, obviously. I just, uh, in my project, see it as a very big challenge, very hard to combine those three legs of development. And uh, maybe we could uh, discuss and debate a bit the, the feasibility of combining those three legs as the project scales up, as you, uh, as you uh, begin from a very community level, and then you go to the city and state and country, um, is that feasible to, or, or how can we think of a feasibility of uh, keeping together those three legs that sustain a modern, or, or at least the Rio Echo 92 definition uh, of development that has these uh, three um, legs. So uh, those are my five uh, remarks. Uh, I thank you a lot for the invitation again, Paul, Fabio, and Andrea. Again, congratulations for your presentation. And uh, thank you again.
Thank you so much, Emmanuel, um, uh, for for um, those um, kind of uh, specific questions and also for posing that trilemma, which I actually think is a really um, helpful, very, very interesting um, framing that um, is, is certainly inspiring a lot of thoughts, uh, at least in my own mind already. Um, uh, so I, I, I suppose now it'd um, uh, be wonderful um, to give Andrea uh, an opportunity to respond to, to some of these um, comments. And, and perhaps after Andrea, I'll, I'll chime in with just a, a thought or two. Um, uh, meanwhile, though, um, you know, we're collecting um, some, some great questions here in the Q&A. Um, of course, I recognize um, you know, we, we may not be able to get to, to all of the questions, but it would be really wonderful um, to, um, to give everyone the chance um, to at least share kind of any, any thoughts, reflections, or questions um, on their minds. So um, as um, we're responding to this initial round of comments, um, please um, do feel free, everyone, to jump in with uh, your own questions in the box, and we'll um, see how many uh, we can uh, we can get to in our in our discussion together. Uh, but but first, um, Andrea, would you like to share any thoughts in, in response to these really um, provocative um, comments from Julian and Emmanuel? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. I think I'll tackle first the the easy easy questions. I'll open here the notes that I took. I'm sorry. Um, so it would be very great to be able to look at the MOOCA circulation after the pandemic um, to answer if anything changed or anything at all. Um, the, the, the two programs that keep it alive, let's put it like this, are still ongoing. The worker support program changed a little bit, and we actually have started to look into how those changes and what those changes are, but it, it is a cash transfer program for workers. So with those two, we imagine that the MOOCA keeps circulating, and, and what I imagine is that it has become more complex and 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 even bigger in, in size, right? Because of the benefit and beneficiaries increase. Actually, the municipality has recently re released uh, the intention to double the beneficiaries of the RBC program. So with that, we can somehow rest assured that the Mumbuka will keep there for the for the time being. And with that, I can also say that. Um, I can also go into the point of what happens if the next mayor does not support the policy. That is actually one of the one of my favorite questions in the in our in the research for Marika evaluation is that how long do you think the Mumbuka will keep happening? How long do you think the program will keep happening? And people have very different answers. We don't have like the the full results yet, but there are people who believe that it will be there forever and who truly believe that it is their right as a citizen. And there are people who believe that it's very tied to the political party that is in Marika right now. So it differs between different types of people. And we don't really, at least I don't really know what differs for those two, two types of people. But what I can say is the currency and the program that supports the currency is a law. So we know from the Bosa family experiences that law can, laws can change, but that implies a little bit more, it, it puts a little bit more hurdles in it. And definitely because the, the coverage of the programs are so widespread among Marika, I think even if the political party changed, it would be hard politically to really make changes in that at least immediate changes to the policy and to the currency circulation. Um, so, yes, I, that also goes into, is it dangerous to have bonuses paid in Mumbukas? Is it unethical? I'm not really sure. I don't, I, um, I think it's a way for the municipality to try to push Mumbukas to other users that are not only the beneficiaries. I think that is the idea behind it, but it is a, an interesting question. The businesses cannot pay their employees in Mubukas, or at least in the platform, there isn't this uh, mechanism put in place. So if they do, we can really trace that, but they they shouldn't be they shouldn't be doing that. Like it's not practical for them as well to be doing that. Um, and then I think I can I think I can go in a little bit about the inequality between different regions in Marika. Haldigo's work actually really made me wonder about a lot of things when we're studying the Mumbuka is it is in fact in the report we are a little bit more with make a little bit more of an overview or broader perspective of the city but Marika's particularity is that it's a pretty big city in terms of um, size and of the area for the population that it has and people have difficulty going from one area to another um, with the local transport and municipal transport and so forth. So it is a little bit segregated and 
there isn't necessarily a sense of a Marika identity for itself. And that also translates to the Mumbuka also as well. So the central region, the center region is the one that uh, we can really see the Mumbuka signs and we can see that everyone takes Mumbukas. When we go there, I eat at restaurants that take Mumbukas. It's very widespread in the center area. But when you go more towards the residential areas, you will little, you'll lose a little bit of that. Um, Although there are businesses that are like small and that people do in their own houses where you can see those signs still. And with that, I think I can go in a little bit uh, into the um, into the sense that what Julian has has brought about the material life of the Mumbuka or the political imaginary behind the Mumbuka. Um, and I'll go back to sharing my screen here because I think it's particularly interesting. Um, I can show a little bit more of the of those pictures that were in the in the report um, here, right? So Marika, it's a business that's saying they take Mubuka. This is the Economy Solidarity Secretariat. But for example, for this presentation, I looked, I googled some more images, and I typed "aceitamos Mubuka" in on. Um, and Google, and this is what we get. So I think this is, I can argue, it is the, the material life of the Mumbuka because it's a digital currency. While well, we see the Mumbuka as, at, at least for, from the outside, is the card that the beneficiaries have. So we can see here that many of the images carry the card the beneficiaries have. And in fact, one thing that we saw from, um, uh, Let's before I say that, let's go over a little bit more. So here we have we we take mumbukas, we take the mumbuka card, and always using the card. And then here we take the worker support program and so forth, and signs in different stores and so forth. I think this is what I would argue is the material life of the mumbuka right now. But what is also interesting and that ties to what Julian was bringing up is that the people in Maricao we found when when talking to them don't actually call the mumbuka the Mumbuka, they call it the Mumbuka card because it's what the beneficiaries get their, benef their, be their benefit on. And beneficiaries are the make up the bulk of the users of the Mumbuka. So we don't actually have a sense if they'd see the Mumbuka as a currency on itself or just as a means of payment. And when the worker support program was introduced, they started saying that instead of saying we take Mumbukas or we take Mumbuka card, we, they said we take worker support program because the Mumbuka idea is so tied to this municipal cash transfer programs. And what I tried to bring in the presentation was that to untie this or to at least go past this dependency a little bit more, the Mumbuka has to, the circulation has to deepen through other agents. And those agents would be businesses or people who receive bonus in Mumbukas or from regular users like me who just think the idea is pretty cool, for example. Um, I think I think this is I think this addresses a little bit. So it's very tied to the cash transfer programs. So the political imaginary is what what people have in mind is the the city government, right? And it's the city government that authorizes the money. So the Mumbuka experience, the Marika experience, is very tied to the second the second theory that Jillian talked about. But if we look at, for example, the Banco Palmas, that was the first community bank in Brazil, and who um, constructed this model for Brazilian uh, local currencies, they started a little bit more similar to the first idea of the commodity because they really became, in Marica, it's top down from the city government down. And in the Palmas region, where the, com the first community bank came about, the first local currency in Brazil came about, it really was local. So it was based on the trust that people had that that would be money. So it's it's also interesting to me to think about what is money and what do people consider money in terms of local currency when we have a model like Marika that came about based on a model that treated money as a matter of trust. And now in Marika, it is a lot more of a state apparatus. And I think it would be nice to hear from Paul a little bit because he was in the call interviews and they touched a lot on some topics that Julian brought about. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Andrea, and, and thank you so much, uh, Julian and Manuel, for for these questions. I mean, uh, we we have now um, quite quite a number of questions in the um, the Q and A uh, uh, box. So I, I, I'm going to just be very very brief um, because I want to get to those um, right away um, and say 
um, that um, the um, kind of the the identification kind of with and around the Mabuka, I mean, to my mind, has become sort of central to the the identity of Marika, um, and it's uh, you know kind of. Uh, in fact, I would say the, the word Mumbuka um, is probably um, uh, in competition only with another term that appeared in, in that Google search that um, that Andrea shared, Pachi, right? This um, uh, program that provided a temporary benefit to um, independently employed, to, to self-employed um, uh, workers and um, and uh, to informal sector workers, um, and is a is an even more substantial, though time delimited, um, benefit um, that was implemented as an emergency measure during the pandemic. Um, you know, the, these are kind of the two words that one sees and hears everywhere in Marika. One does not hear the official name of the program, Henda Bazika de Ciudadania, the Citizens Basic Income. That, that simply isn't, isn't spoken by individuals in, in Marika. Um, the, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 one, one also doesn't really hear references to the solidarity economy as a whole, um, to cooperativism. Um, you don't even really hear discussion of kind of the Mumbuka as an infrastructure that is uniting all of these things. You, you hear kind of the use of the term Mumbuka, or as, as Andrea said, you know, I think very correctly, cartel Mumbuka, the Mumbuka card, um, even if people are paying with the app, um, as a stand-in for Citizens Basic Income Program, and then Pachi as the stand-in for um, this kind of non-income um, um, limited um, uh, emergency benefit program, um, which I mean, I think I mean it's it's sort of hard to know exactly um, sort of what to do with that information um, because um, you know it, it, it per perhaps one way to read it is that it it conveys like the kind of um, persistence of certain like. Um, social assistance-based um, kind of mental frameworks for thinking about the the state's intervention in the local economy as being kind of kind of hard to move beyond, um, and the kind of popular conception really being rooted in kind of what what are the, what are the specific programs that the state is doing, and kind of what are what you know who are the beneficiaries of those programs as being kind of a framework that that it seems like people are having a hard time. Um, or, or just aren't inclined to move beyond. It seems like those are the resources that are sort of most immediate, immediately available at hand for sort of making sense of these of these programs. And just one other kind of quick observation that is the subject of a, of a forthcoming paper that um, um, that um, Fernando Freitas um, and, and Jessica Maldonado and I um, have um, coming. Uh, later this year um, that um, draws on um, interviews with a number of beneficiaries, non-beneficiaries and implementers uh, of the program um, and, and specifically addresses the question of stigma. Um, and we, you know, we find a really a, kind of a, a, a radical reduction in perceptions of stigma as the number of beneficiaries has increased and as the uh, kind of bambukas in circulation have increased. But what is really striking is that there are still um, perceptions uh, or, or so, sometimes people will mention that they feel stigmatized when using the Mambuka itself takes longer or requires a special apparatus at stores. Um, so if there's a sense that, well, we're paying with Mambuka, so someone has to bring out their special cell phone um, that they have you know, with the, the app to receive Mambukas, and that takes more time, and maybe someone is going to sort of complain a little bit or you know, kind of, kind of groan um, because there's this additional step involved, that seems to be still the moment at which um, these um, kind of perceptions of, of stigma um, continue to maybe impact users, even though the overall um, kind of reports of experiences of stigma have, de have declined really dramatically. So, I mean, certainly a, um, a, uh, a kind of, I don't know, f further kind of consideration around sort of the, uh, the uh, kind of almost sort of like the, the infrastructure of the currency as be being, uh, you know, really critical, I guess, to the um, experience of the human experiences of its use. Um, but, you know, th these aren't especially coherent thoughts, but just um, kind of uh, two, two thoughts that emerge in response. Um, well, so I, I would also kind of love, love to speak to this question of the trilemma, though I don't really have anything intelligent to say about it, uh, but I, I, I really just love the concept so much that I, I want to continue thinking about it. Um, uh, but, but uh, you know, rather than try to sort of try to talk through sort of a, a I wouldn't even say half-baked, quarter-baked um, sort of attempt to, um, to respond to this really um, uh, fascinating framing, um, I think it would be great maybe just to take a couple of the, um, the now 15 questions that we have here in the um, the Q and A, um, and and see if we can um, address um, at least um, sort of uh, a, a number of them um, uh, before we run out of time here. Um, so there were a couple of um, of questions that center on the transaction fees um, that are uh, are uh, charged around the use of the Mambuka. So businesses pay um, to convert uh, Mambukas into hay ice, um, and um, uh, there are also, um, you know, fees that accompany all transactions in Mambukas um, that 
uh, end up generating the funds that are used um, to support uh, these uh, zero and, and low interest loans offered to, uh, to businesses and to groups of residents in Marika. Um, so I wonder, um, Andrea, um, if you would be able to speak to um, the, um, the fees that are charged, sort of what is the purpose? As far as you understand, how are these fees determined? How are they understood? Um, why are the fees different in some cases versus you know, 1% versus 2%? Um, so uh, perhaps you could speak to, to, to this question a bit. Yes, of course. That's a lot more tied to the Ed Dinero platform, who is the provider of the service, than to the Mambuka Bank itself. So it, it was the standard for the Ed Dinero practice. Ed Dinero is was conceived by the original com community bank in Banco Palmas that I mentioned before. So this is standard. The idea behind the fees is that, um, for example, if you talk to Joaquin, who is um, the president of the Edinator platform, they charge fees because it would be like charging a fee to use the, the credit uh, machine. At least here in Brazil, when you have the little machine, you have to pay a fee and then they charge the fee that would be similar. To, it would be to upkeep the service. In case of Marika, uh, so in other uh, banks, for example, this fee would go half to the bank, to the community bank, and half to pay for the Adinero services. In the case of Marica, the city government actually pays for the Adinero service, and all of it goes to the Mumbuka Bank Fund. So it's just arbitrary. I think it's the quick answer. No, oh, great. Thank you. Well, I, I wonder, actually, um, could you um, also perhaps um, speak a bit to the um, uh, kind of the different institutions that are involved in the um, in the Mumbuka, you, you mentioned Iginero Institute. Um, you mentioned kind of the, the the bank at the at the center of the Brazilian network of community banks. Uh, you know, who are these different players? And uh, and this kind of dialogues with one of the questions that was asked here in the chat. Sort of, you know, to what extent should we think of the Mumbuka as a state project versus the project of a community bank or a group of residents or a civil society organization? Okay, so this uh, this actually was one of the informations that took us the longest to put together. Uh, but there are th three players, let's put it like that. The city government who passed the municipal law that idealized the community bank and the Mumbuka currency. The Edinero platform that is another institute um, that, you know, provides the service of the platform and that also helped the Mumbuka Bank establish itself. And then you have the Mumbuka Bank that is the community bank um, that is um, tied to the city government, but it's not in the city government. Both the El Dinero and the Mumbuka Bank are OS, is what we would say here in, in Brazil, is they are an um, NGO, they are NGOs. So they are not uh, up for profit and they are not like mm, traditional private institutions, let's say like that. Um, so yeah, th these are the three players. The Mumbuka, I would say, is a state project because it was created by the city government and it is funded by the city government. What I would say is not necessarily so much of a state project would be the solidarity economy practice of the Mumbuka Bank. So in things like providing microcredit lines and, and social activities, like the Mumbuka Bank finances, like I think two dance school for kids. They 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 um, sponsor local athletes. One of the athletes went to the Olympics to represent Brazil. So these things the Mumbuka Bank does are more um, in in line with the Mumbuka Bank itself and its own practices that are geared more towards community. So those three are very intertwined, but they have different goals and they have different players uh, that are coordinating steps. Thank you. Um, well, well, so um, we, we have a question from a, a really um, uh, a distinguished um, guest here at, at um, today's um, uh, webinar, um, who is, of course, um, uh, Brazilian um, Senator Eduardo Suplicy, uh, who is uh, the uh, intellectual father of uh, the, uh, I, think I, I think I could say, the basic income movement in Brazil and one of the most um, prominent advocates for uh, basic income in the world. Um, also, um, in many ways, the inspiration for the Citizens Basic Income Program in Mardica uh, and uh, a, a source of um, of uh, endless um, enthusiasm and, and excitement around um, basic income. Uh, so um, Senator Suplicy has shared uh, the, the question, um, uh, congratulations, I could not um, participate, um, uh, unfortunately, um, because of a, a plenary session in the Congress, uh, but his question is, um, to what extent 
has the first stage of the basic income in Marika, um, which has reached 42,500 citizens, already contributed to eradicate extreme and absolute poverty there. And what are our predictions for uh, the end of 2024, uh, when the program should be increasing in scope? Okay, so this is very much in line for the Marika Evaluation Project. This is what we are ambitiously aiming to do and um, more on that coming by the end of this year, hopefully. But I think I can I can share a little bit of my own observations of when I go to Marika or when I talk to beneficiaries. Um, the And I think it would be nice to, to, to point here since Eduardo Sopesi is here, thank you so much, um, that the, although the, the policy is start, it reaches 42,000 people and by the end of this year it's supposed to double in size um, I'm not sure exactly but about the city goals for the end of 2024 um, but next year we have municipal elections coming up so uh, we are eager to see where that takes us although it is a targeted benefit at right now in the law it states that it is a right to all its citizens so, but it started gradually from the most vulnerable populations um, up. And this is a coordinated effort as well with the social assistance secretariat, right, to identify the most vulnerable and to reach them. So it's not only that people come to register and enroll in the program, but they also the, the program also reaches out to people who are most vulnerable. And the people that we, I was able to talk to um, say that the, the, city, the basic income program, the citizens basic income program has really helped them um, to, I remember talking to mothers that talked about buying supplies for their kids. I remember talking to them, talking about buying uh, nicer cookies for them, for example. Um, and that all seems to point to um, a more, Comfortable way of spending is how I interpret it. Um, so I think I think those are the comments that that I would make, and uh, I don't want to be um, precipitated while talking about the uh, the reduction in poverty and so forth. But what we do see here in the census is that um, this Marika city grew 54% in size of the population, and I think that is a testament as well to how this programs have been affecting people or even giving people hope in in like getting a job or maybe being benefited by the program eventually. I don't know, Paul, if you have something else to add because you also have a, a lot of experience with this. Uh, well, I'm going to fight off the temptation um, because we, we uh, there, I'd love to get to two more questions um, if we uh, if we can, um, including a last question for all of the panelists. But uh, first, a, a, a kind of a narrower question or a more, a more um, concrete question um, from Eduardo Gimis, um, who's a professor at um, the Fundação Getúlio Vargas, is, is kindly with us um, today. Um, wanted to ask about uh, kind of whether um, we've considered using um, the distribution of the Mumbuka across the territory of Marika um, as a consideration in the analysis, and also whether the classifications of businesses used um, in the report come from uh, the uh, Mumbuka Bank itself or um, are um, you know, a, a layer of analysis that, um, that we have added on. Yes, and uh, those two are very related. The classification is actually self-reported, so it comes from the Mumbuka Bank. And um, it's to be taken with a grain of salt, in my conservative opinion, let's put it like this, because especially smaller informal businesses tend to change segments of action quite frequently. And what we do have in the Mubuka Bank is that uh, a lot of the businesses registered are informal, and that also makes it hard to track where they are geographically. Actually, Sina, one of the people who collaborate from the GFI who collaborated with us on the report, intended to do a geographical map, a heat map of the businesses distribution within the city. But because so many of the businesses were informal, we, we couldn't exactly pinpoint uh, where they were, and that made it a lot harder. So that's also ties to the you know geographical location and the different geographical um, development of different areas because it's not as simple in a country like Brazil where there's a lot of informal businesses to track them and to you know map them out but um, in short yeah they, they were provided by the bank itself it was self-reported and it would be great to do a geographical map of the of the Mumbuka circulation and we face uh, a big hurdle in Marika that is they have a very complicating address system and it's hard to to map it out but um, we the 
IDR, it's an institute in Marica, has aimed to do that. And I think they have been a lot more successful than uh, we had been because they are going there with um, geographic tags. Hopefully they will release their study soon. Well, thank you, Andrea. Well, so I, I know we're, we're coming up right against the, the end of the event. Um, I, I would love to pose kind of one more question um, for all of the panelists and also then to um, grant the opportunity um, to offer any uh, concluding thoughts along with a response to this question. Um, but of course, if, if anyone needs to, to drop off, um, no uh, problem whatsoever. Um, the uh, the question I, I, I'd like to, um, to pose comes from um, comments that um, Isabella Marchin's um, uh, Greipengeiser um, shared in the, in the chat. Um, so Isabella um, did her um, master's thesis um, on the basis of interviews with businesses in Mardika. And actually, we've had a really fruitful dialogue um, uh, over the, uh, the course of, um, of, of this investigation. I think it's a really, really fascinating study um, that adds a, a, a new and very important layer um, to, this, um, to this work. Uh, so uh, Isabella shared, um, among other observations, um, that um, in her interviews, um, it seemed that um, responses to the Mambuka program um, often mapped onto pre-existing kind of political beliefs, and uh, that those who were opposed um, to um, what is uh, clearly understood to be a left-wing government in the city of Marika, linked to a left-wing project nationally, um, tended to be more skeptical of the Mumbuka. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, she actually cites one interview with a, uh, a business owner who says, well, you know, I, I don't agree with the Mumbuka. I don't think this is good. This is someone who reported that they voted for Bolsonaro, um, but uh, I accept the Mumbuka because otherwise it would be leaving money on the table. Um, so I, I, I just wonder, you know, um, uh, I guess the question I would ask is, um, you know, to what extent are these sorts of local development and complementary currency projects understood in, in the experience of all of the panelists to be associated with the left wing? I mean, is this a kind of common phenomenon? Is there more skepticism um, that seems to be, you know, coming from um, the right around these kinds of programs? I mean, does that seem to be something that that fundamentally limits what they can achieve? And, you know, are there any strategies uh, maybe to um, uh, increase uh, the appeal of a program like this across the uh, the political spectrum? And of course, in addition to this question, any closing thoughts that um, that any of the panelists would uh, would like to share, um, you know, would be would be fantastic. Um, so so I wonder maybe we can go in reverse order um, and. Uh, Emmanuel, if you would like to um, to offer any thoughts um, in response to this question or anything else that we've discussed, I'd love to love to hear them. Yes, uh, thank you, Paul, for the question. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have the, an answer for that, but just I just think that uh, in order to maybe um, separate uh, what Mumbuka does from an exclusively uh, left wing uh, platform, maybe you should uh, try to. Like in economics, you have lots of uh, thinking about how to um, align individual interests and uh, collective interests. So um, I think that the hard problem is how to align both of them. Because once you do that, uh, the person does not think about being left or right. Uh, he or she sees that what he does or she does for herself is good for the community and vice versa. So um, I, I guess the, the problem is how uh, we can uh, show that what, what, what because uh, you, you talked about this, um, what is it, an entrepreneur or a shop owner that is a supporter of Bolsonaro and, and said, oh, that, that, that's, that's not what I, uh, what I like to see. But I mean, once he sees that that's good for himself um, and for the community, it doesn't it shouldn't matter at least of course it does matter because he has some uh, of uh, uh, some uh, political leanings of course but i mean um that that makes it harder for him to depart from the, the, the general idea of the pro program uh, uh if his or her interests are being um accomplished together with the, with the community and that makes it okay well it's a left government but i don't like it but it's good for me and it's good for, for the city. Um, I mean, um, maybe it's like um, uh, an uh, utopia to think that everybody will agree uh, on a pro program like that. Not, not everybody agrees with that, but uh, it's possible to maybe align uh, interests and then uh, to detach a little bit uh, the, the idea of a left program for the idea of a program that can, you know, as best as possible to align private and public interests. Maybe, uh, of course, that, that, that's what's difficult to, to, 
to come up to it. it uh, the discussion um, uh, will lead to the role of institutions and uh, things like that. But I think that's uh, too complicated for us to to discuss right now. But yes, well, thank you again for the for the question. Yeah. No, thank you, Amango. Um, yeah. Julian, would uh, you like to um, share any any thoughts? Yeah. First, I want to uh, thank Isabella for the comments and questions. I'd uh, be excited to read her work if that's available. Um, I have two thoughts here, and they sort of go along the lines of, I guess, two components of um, uh, the Mumbuka program. Um, first of all, the basic income component. Um, the experience in the USA has been that uh, um, when benefits are introduced, uh, they are fought you know, over tooth and nail. Uh, because um, conservatives who resist them know that once um, people have gotten used to them, <laughs> they will they will not give them up. Um, so I suspect this is part of the story of the Mumbuka, and it's really just a matter of time before basic income becomes uh, like like other benefits, something that is um, uh, kind of a third rail of politics because no one wants to take it away. Um, uh, I don't know. May, maybe Brazil is different, but I but I think this is true everywhere that um, uh, state benefits eventually become part of a person's wealth, and no one wants to be um, divested of that. Um, the second thought is that so it's a really Paul's question about money is really interesting. Whether complementary currencies are associated with sort of left wing um, uh, uh, platforms. Um, yes, if we think about lots of the sort of like locally based. Uh, complementary currencies, things like time hours, um, uh, various kinds of currency that try to sort of evaluate people's labor. Right? I think these are not so much left-wing uh, programs so much as they are utopian or uh, projects that try to change the way that things are. Um, I, I mean, just to go back to cryptocurrencies, I mean, these are similarly utopian. Um, they just aren't uh, on the left. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that they're clearly on the right either. So, you know, the, the, the right is sort of a large baggy category. And I think there are, um, uh, there are social conservatives who resist all forms of utopian thinking because um, they feel more comfortable with status quo authorities. Um, and I, I can see where the resistance to sort of um, uh, messing with one's money <laughs> comes from, from that sector. Um, but so, so I really think the, the way to think about what's going on with resistance to new forms of money is that it's a it's a resistance to new ideas or resistance to to change, um, and and maybe the best um, maybe the best response to that kind of skepticism is to um, continue to do careful research and show what benefits actually arise from this, right? So that it doesn't seem like some um, sort of purely utopian. Uh, vision, uh, but it, but it seems like uh, a project that has some expertise and research behind it. Of course, there are people who resist expertise these days as well. But what can you do about that? No, thank you, uh, Julian. And I, I mean, I, I love that suggestion also because it uh, you know uh, kind of bolsters our <laughs> the the importance and value of of work, much like um, the um, a really amazing um, report that that Andrea um, has has presented to us today. Um, so uh, th thank you very much for for those thoughts. And, and Andrea, I, I, I'd now love to. Um, sort of hand hand the the floor to you for the kind of closing closing thoughts for today's session. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you everyone. Thank you one, everyone that asked questions and everyone that watched. And of course, thank you to the commentators as well and Paul. I think on this question about you know local currency being left wing, right wing. I think at least here in the region of Rio, this experience is very tied to the Marica experience. And Marica is a city in Rio that has this particularity that for the almost past two decades is it the only city in Brazil in the Workers' Party, uh, is the only city in Rio, sorry, it, that has the municipal uh, government of the Workers' Party. So I think because of that, it's really tied to the left, this left wing ideal, uh, because, oh, Marica, you know, it's everything is red, and everything is red in Marica, that is true. Um, so I think here, we might run into this hurdle, but the idea behind community banks and local currencies is not necessarily tied to any of these spectrums. I think one of the um, solutions, I guess, would be either to maybe um, 
tie it to a you know cash transfer program because it's easy for people to accept it at least for the people who are receiving the cash transfer or for businesses that are benefit from it as Isabella exemplified in her comment because you are not if you're a business owner you're not going to lose on the chance of making the profit right so you you could either tie to this or maybe you know you could think of um neighborhoods. I, I talked to a, a lady from Sao Paulo that she's working on a project. It's an independent project. It's not a state project to develop this community bank between two neighborhoods in Sao Paulo. So I think when it comes from this community sense, when it's built from the bottom up, uh, maybe it can be dissociated from this ideal of left wing and right wing. But what I can say and um, what I briefly mentioned in the report also is that the, this model has influenced other cities here and other cities that are not necessarily as left wing as Marika. And during the last municipal elections, many candidates from other cities that are not necessarily right left wing as well ran with proposals that are similar to the programs in Marika because of its appeal, because of its popular appeal. So I think uh, these things are very much intertwined, but they can be a little bit detangled and we definitely should look more towards it. And I'm excited about Paul's work and also the Marika evaluation work that's coming out that will probably touch up on at least a few elements of this, or at least the elements of people's impressions and businesses impressions. So I'm very excited about that. And I think uh, as a final remark, this is an ongoing project. I would love to continue to investigate this throughout other years and maybe even in Niteroi, who is an even bigger city than Marika. So it would be interesting to look at the differences. It's a bigger city, it's more, cosmopolitan than Marika. So what would be the differences? You know, this is a, a, a an area of study that's very ample. And I'm also glad that Julian uh, promoted the work of researchers and, and thank you everyone for showing interest. And I, I hope you keep it being interested. <laughs> Well, well, thank you so much for the, for that um, uh, closing thought, um, Andrea. And again, I mean, for the really fantastic research um, that uh, you know I think um, is uh, really creative, um, really illuminating, um, and um, provided also uh, an excellent um, foundation for today's um, really great conversation. Um, that of course owes um, tremendously as well to Julian and Manuel. So uh, thank you um, so much for your your you know really generous engagement uh, and uh, you know for sharing. Um, uh, you know, so many uh, reflections and thoughts with us today. Um, uh, as Andrea noted, um, you know, this is one part of a broader um, evaluation um, and analysis of uh, the um, basic income program and the broader solidarity economy in um, Marika. Uh, I've just um, left the uh, the link in the chat um, to uh, the website for the Marika basic income evaluation. So uh, we should be having, uh, we should be sharing, um, you know, qualitative results in the coming months. We should be sharing our uh, major quantitative findings and by the end of this year. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to keep abreast of these developments, um, you know, you can head over to the website and um, sign up also for our very, very occasional newsletter uh, to uh, uh, you know, keep, keep up with, um, with uh, the many developments that we anticipate in the, in the coming months and years. Um, so uh, thanks so much, everyone, um, especially again to our panelists, Andrea, uh, Julian, and Emmanuel, uh, and to everyone who, who joined um, in our discussion today, uh, to Clea, uh, who ha has been instrumental in um, organizing the logistics for today's webinar, uh, in our editorial department, and everyone at JFI um, for their support of this project. Also, uh, though he's not here, uh, to Francis Tsang for the uh, amazing visualization. Um, it's really been a, a pleasure um, to have this discussion today, uh, and uh, we hope to keep the conversation going. So uh, thanks so much for joining us, and I hope to see you at a, at a future event soon.